This week we're going to talk about research summaries, which is the second part of the ACT science knowledge test. And in many ways, this will be a review of the first week because much of the many of the principles that we discussed in the scientific method will also be discussed in this as well. The research summaries basically constitute a description of two or more experiments along with statements of the result of the experiments. So let's go back through some things about the scientific method that we need to remember as we go through the research summaries. Research summaries require that you think like a scientist. And actually, this is one of the things that I want to impart on you in general, is that there is a way of thinking that is scientific in nature. And part of the reason that we take all of these courses in high school is to at least be exposed to that kind of thinking. It requires that you follow a pattern of thinking, which is called the scientific method. When you understand this method, you will have more success on this part of the test. There are no test questions that are specific to the scientific method, but you have to understand the scientific method in order to answer the questions. So these, this list reviews the parts of the scientific member. You will remember that you start with a problem or a statement of the problem. In this list, they include research, which is gathering information about the question that you're interested in. Statement of the problem is the same idea as stating the question. Then you form a hypothesis based on your observations and research. Perform an experiment related to the hypothesis, which is set up in such a way as to either reject the hypothesis or accept it. Record and analyze the data. And then basically state a conclusion, which is either rejecting the hypothesis or embracing it as being true. And then many times there's a verification step where you do another ex similar experiment just to, to, to verify that your initial results were accurate. When you form a hypothesis, you remember that this is the educated guess and you make it in the form of a statement of fact, even though it's not really a statement of fact. This is done so that you can design your experiments to fit either a rejection of the hypothesis or an acceptance of the hypothesis. And the hypothesis has to be generated first, or the experiments are, are at risk of not being designed properly. You'll remember there are almost always two groups, a control group and an experimental group. The control group does not include whatever's being tested. This can also be viewed as how things would be done or how things were if the intervention was, did not take place. The experimental group is the one where the variable that's being tested is actually changed or modified. The results obtained from the experiment must, will either cause you to reject or accept the hypothesis. If you reject the hypothesis, it means that you disprove, in a sense, the hypothesis. If you accept it, it means that you've proven the hypothesis. The rules for experiment, most experiments properly designed will have a control group. The experiment should not test more than one variable at a time. In order for you to be able to make direct correlations in your results, you have to only vary one aspect of the experiment at each point. An experiment should not be designed in such a way to prove what you already believe to be true. And then lastly, only the data from the experiment should be used in the conclusion. In other words, you may have data, you, well, two things. One is the conclusion may be different than what you actually believe to be true. And secondly, there may be data outside of the experiment which suggests a different conclusion. However, neither of these factors should come into the actual conclusion that you make from this from the experiment. What is a control? Why must there be a control group? What is a variable? How many variables can be tested in an experiment? 
we said that a control is the group or the standard group that is not changed or intervened with. The reason for the control group is that it helps to show that when you keep other things stable or constant and only change one thing, you can compare the two groups directly and draw conclusions based on the data. The variable is that which you are manipulating and it is recommended that you only have one variable per experiment. The control is an individual or group participating in the experiment under the same conditions of the other group except that the variable or factor that's being manipulated is not changed. The reason for the control group is it serves as the standard outcome to expect if you hadn't changed the experimental variable. And this allows you to have a direct comparison with the other group or the experimental group. What is the variable? The variable is the, the aspect of the experiment that you change. It's what you're focusing on with your testing. An independent variable is the one that causes changes in other variables and it is the one manipulated by the experimenter. The dependent variable is the variable that changes because of the independent variable or is presumed that it's changing because of the independent variable. It is dependent upon the independent variable. And as I said before, in most experiments it's recommended that you only change one variable at a time. So let's just look for a second at an example of this. The hypothesis is that plants grow better in the dark. Now why a person would, the question would be, do, do plants grow better in light or with light or do they grow better in the dark conditions? Now normally plants live in, in conditions of light and so the control group would be to grow plants in normal light conditions. The experimental group would be that everything else about how you care for the plant would be the same as the control group except you would keep the plant in the dark. The control group is needed for the comparison to be made with the experimental group. What is the independent variable? What is the variable that's being controlled by the investigator? In this case, the independent variable is whether light condition is whether the plant is in normal light conditions or in the dark. What is the dependent variable? The dependent variable is however you decide to measure how well a plant grows. So the dependent variable is, is you know potentially plant height or the color of the plant, whether it's normal green or some other color, etc. So let's practice a little bit determining dependent versus independent variables. Each description starts with a statement of what the experiment is designed to explore. So when you look at research summaries, you need to understand the problem, and the problem is very clearly set out by what is stated in the hypothesis. The hypothesis will make a statement about the problem. You need to make sure that whenever you read a research summary that you start out by knowing exactly what the problem that they're trying to test is. This will help you understand all of the other aspects that the experiment has. So you read this statement very carefully and make sure you understand this statement. You then look at the design of the experiment. Underline the words that describe what is being varied, what is being measured. Those are the two things that you need to pick out. What is the scientist or investigator manipulating? And then what is the scientist or investigator measuring in order to see what happens after the manipulation is undertaken? Very important to make sure you take a look at that. So there are actually multiple types of experimental designs. Two that are common are described in the next couple of slides. The first is 
is to take a look at something in the natural world. So you making you're making ex measurements of some kind that are occurring on around you, and you are measuring relationships between variables. You have to use your hypothesis in order to identify the variables you want to measure. Now, in many cases, you're not actually intervening. That is, you're not actually changing anything. What you're doing is trying to measure two aspects of the environment that are changing to see if they have an effect on each other. Here an example that's given is global warming and the event, the effect on the polar ice. Now the, the question is, does global warming cause a change in the polar ice cap or does it change the amount of melting that occurs in the polar ice cap? The hypothesis might be something like, I believe that global warming causes an increase in the melting of the polar ice cap. So you're measuring two things that you're not actually changing yourself, but that changes on their own as life goes on. And one is the temperature, and the other is how much melting of the polar ice cap occurs. The second experiment is an experiment where you change variables where you actually intervene. And the first experiment sometimes is called an observational examination or an observational trial. The second is a direct intervention trial. In both cases, there are independent and dependent variables. You just have to, in the observation group, because you're not actually intervening, you have to identify what you're calling the independent variable. In, in the case of our polar ice cap, it would be the temperature or global warming, the dependent variable would be the melting of the polar ice. In cases of interventional studies, you directly change something, and that's the independent variable, and then you measure the effect of that on another variable, which is called the dependent variable. It is absolutely critical in all of this that you understand what the variables are. The other thing you have to understand is the controls. What things are being held constant in order to prevent them from having an effect on what you're measuring aside from what you've done with the independent variable. Now in interventional tr studies, this is actually much simpler. You take specific precautions to ensure that you eliminate all the other potential variables that could impact what you're measuring other than the, the independent variable, which is what you're changing. So for example, in the light uh, plant experiment that we discussed earlier, you want to make sure that you have the same soil, the same water, the same air, etc., it's the same plants, etc., to prevent them from doing something called confounding. Confounding is when a factor outside of your control changes the outcome of the experiment and causes the experiment to not be as valid. The study results, we, we've talked about this at length in the previous week. They are data, there are different ways to represent the data, diagrams, charts, graphs, etc. Again, I won't go through this again, but you want to look for trends. You want to make sure you understand how the data is presented. Also, when you look at research summaries, think about what you would do differently. In other words, not all studies are designed equally and some have flaws. And, and there could be questions on a quiz or test that would ask you, if you were going to do this study, what would you do differently? Um, and it may give you choices. Did they control for all the things they should have controlled for? Do, are the conclusions appropriate from the uh, data that was collected? Are there any other types of errors that were introduced into the experiment? 